Welcome back. Last time we looked at how a CPU runs instructions and put together an outline for a CPU emulator. Before we're ready to start implementing the entire NES CPU, there are a few more details we need to understand. The first of these is how the CPU can handle negative numbers. So far, we've only looked at representing positive numbers in a computer. Though, with a simple trick, the same hardware can do math with positive numbers just as easily as it can do math with negative numbers. The most popular form of representing negative numbers is called two's complement. Nearly all CPUs, including the 6502 that is used in the NES, use two's complement to represent negative numbers. In two's complement, the leftmost bit is used to indicate whether a number is negative or not. This means only seven bits are left to represent the value. Negative numbers count up starting at minus 128. Here we can see a few. We call a number signed if it's using the leftmost bit to represent whether a number is positive or negative. We call a number unsigned if we want to use all eight bits to represent the value. A cool trick with two's complement is that all the existing operations for positive numbers work just as well as they do with negative numbers. Let's take a look at what happens when we add negative 1 and 1, both represented with 2's complement. Here we have minus 1 and 1, and when we perform the addition, we see that the leftmost bit, which is actually bit 9, would be set to 1, and all the other bits are 0. Since we only store 8 bits, we ignore the 1 bit and have 0 left. So negative 1 and 1 gives us 0. We can say that 2's complement is compatible with unsigned numbers in two ways. First is that the representation of positive numbers is exactly the same. So if your positive number is within the range that would be accepted for a signed number, no conversion is required. Adding, subtracting, etc., all the operations that we might want to do for unsigned numbers works exactly the same as with signed numbers. So the CPU doesn't actually know or care if the value you're adding is signed or unsigned. It is up to the programmer to know whether a value is to be understood as signed or unsigned. One gotcha is that signed numbers have a slightly narrower range of representable values compared to unsigned numbers. But fortunately, the status register will actually help us catch any problems here. Let's take a look at the status register in a little more detail. We actually saw it briefly previously when we looked at the registers of the 6502 CPU. The status register is an 8-bit register. For the most part, it can't be accessed directly, but it does get updated as a side effect of most of the instructions. Let's take a look at what each of the 8 bits in the status register actually mean. Here we can see a representation of it, and I have numbered the bits, 0 being the 1's place, 1 pointing to the 2's place, 2 pointing to the 4's place, and so on. The letters underneath signify what each of these bits correspond to. N is the negative bit, V is the overflow bit, B is for break, I is for interrupt disable, Z is for zero, and C is for carry. Let's work through each of these one bit at a time. For the descriptions that follow, I'll describe it as though the given instruction has this flag enabled, though not every instruction will enable every flag. And if a flag is not enabled for a given instruction, it will have the same value after running the instruction as it did before. 
first up is negative and connects directly with what we were just looking at previously. The negative bit is set whenever the leftmost bit, also known as the sign bit, of the result is set. This will only matter to the programmer if the operation was on signed numbers. 128, the unsigned value, would also have the leftmost bit set, and thus would set the negative flag. This can be useful for implementing less than on the CPU. If you subtract two numbers, a minus b, and see that negative was set afterwards, then you know that a was less than b. Next up we have overflow, which tracks signed overflow. We can think of overflow as a way to detect when a number becomes either too positive or too negative to be stored as a signed number. Since the most negative number we can represent in 7 bits is minus 128 and the most positive number 127, this bit gets set whenever the result would have been less than 100 minus 128 or greater than 127. This is only useful when working with sign numbers, though we'll see another bit that tracks similar overflow for unsigned numbers. Next we have break. This is used to track whether an interrupt was called by the break instruction or by a hardware interrupt. We will see more on interrupts in a little bit. Next, we have interrupt disable. Some system interrupts can be disabled and is done so by setting this bit in the status register. There are two special instructions to either set or clear this bit, which have the effect of enabling or disabling these certain interrupts. Next, we have zero. As the name suggests, this gets set when the result is zero. This is often used for checking whether two values are equal. You can subtract two numbers and then check the zero bit. If you do a minus b and then find that the zero bit is set, then you know that a and b are equal. And finally, we have the carry flag, which is sort of like unsigned overflow. Earlier, we saw that the overflow bit is set when a given value couldn't be represented in the seven bits available for a signed number. This carry bit is basically the equivalent for unsigned numbers. Since 255 is the largest value that we can represent in an 8-bit unsigned number, the carry flag gets set if the result would have been larger than 255. Here we can take a look at what 255 looks like in binary. If we were to add 1 to this, it would have 1 in the sort of 9th bit, and the 8 bits that we can actually store are all 0. With an 8-bit machine, however, that 1 would disappear, and we would be left with all zeros. This 1 actually goes to the carry bit, and allows us to check whether this had occurred. Fortunately, most of the math operations in the CPU will update the overflow bit, so that the programmer can check, if necessary, that this occurred. So now we know what all these bits mean. How do we know when this register needs to be updated? Any reference for the 6502 CPU will tell us, for each instruction, what flags need to be updated. If a flag is updated for this instruction, it will get a new value as we just looked at. 
otherwise it is left unmodified. I'll link a reference in the description that points out which flags get updated for which instructions. So now we've looked at all the status register bits, but two of them seemed a little strange. We haven't really looked at interrupts, which explain the operation of the break and interrupt disable flags. So let's finally take a look at interrupts. As the name suggests, interrupts are a way to interrupt the normal processing of the CPU. Interrupts can be triggered by hardware or by the break instruction. Sometimes the system needs to urgently tell the CPU of something, for example, in order to meet strict timing requirements. An example of this would be the graphics chip of the NES. It can interrupt the CPU to inform it that it has just finished drawing the screen. This is its way of telling the CPU that it can now prepare the next frame of graphics. When an interrupt is performed, the CPU will save its current progress and start running code in a different location. When this new code, also known as the interrupt handler, is complete, it will restore its previous state and continue processing where it was earlier. Some interrupts can be disabled by the interrupt disable bit we saw earlier. There are also some interrupts that cannot be disabled. These are called non-maskable interrupts, or NMI. Maskable simply means whether or not the interrupt can be disabled. So how does the CPU save its state? Finally, this brings us to the stack. The stack is a way of managing usage of temporary values in memory. Values added to the stack can be retrieved in the reverse order that they were added. That is, the value added most recently will be the one retrieved first. Sometimes this is called last in first out or LIFO. It is called a stack because it can be thought of as a stack of books or of plates or something like that. Here we can see a little visual example. We call this value hex BE at the bottom of the stack, and it will have a larger address. And as values are added to the stack, they sort of go on top and are stored in smaller addresses. The stack is managed by the 8-bit SP register. When we add, also known as push, a value onto the stack, the value goes into the memory address held by SP. SP is then decreased by 1. The opposite of this is called popping or pulling a value. And what happens is the reverse. First, SP is increased, and then the value at that location is returned. In modern computing, getting the value out of a stack is usually called popping. But at the time the 6502 was made, this was called pulling. You might see both when you look at other documentation for the CPU. One quirk with the 6502 is that SP is only 8 bits, and yet it refers to a location in memory. And we know that memory addresses are typically 16 bits. What's happening here is actually very much like what we saw with the zero page. The stack can only point to memory addresses between hex 0100 and hex 01FF. So to get from a value held in the SP to the real memory address, 
you just add hex O100. When we used a similar trick with a zero page, we put zero zero in that other byte. But for the stack, we put zero one. All right. And with that, we've finally seen all the key features in the 6502 CPU that is used in the NES. Next up, I'll look at a few tips for implementing a 6502 CPU emulator. That's all for this video. Hope you enjoyed. See you on the next one.